Hello and welcome back to the Premier Injuries podcast for game week three. We are going to discuss all things to do with injuries in the Premier League. We're going to give you insights into injuries with knowledge on return times and cutting through rumour or misinformation. Plus we talk tactics and data of the players and the impact they have on their teams. This will be at the same time every Thursday through the season. So if you have any inquiries, you can comment below or tweet any of us. Uh, Also, before we get into the big analysis of this game week, please remember to like, share and subscribe to the channel. But Raj, welcome back. A pleasure as always. Another tough week of being an Arsenal fan, isn't it? Tough life, man. I'm going to leave it at that. (laughs) And Ben, you know, how how are you doing today? I'm good, and it's always, always a tough week following Newcastle. <laughs> well, I suppose the qu- the question to both of you and to myself as an Arsenal fan is: It now just a straight up relegation battle between Arsenal and Newcastle? <laughs> it's, it's not a it's not a balance. Where where she wins one? No, we'll, we'll be all right. You know what it is. Big Jordy Joe arrival on Tainsey last week. He'll come good. We're, we will tick all the boxes for Mike Ashley. We will scrape 13th, 14th or 15th. He'll be laughing his big fat jowls all the way at the bank. Uh, we'll continue moaning on. Um, we'll lambast Steve Bruce. But ultimately, you know, we'll still go on supporting them and mourning them. And I guess, Raj, do, do we do better than 13th, 14th? I mean, I'd hope so. <laughs> Let's see. I mean, the, the, I mean, the big question is once players once the players are back whether it's from COVID whether it's from injury so you know tough start to this season so if you're, if you're gonna have COVID might as well have it now during these really difficult fixtures which you may have lost it anyways so yeah perhaps that's a silver lining so just get healthy international break comes at a great time and then of course you have the new news potentially a segue with the Premier League potentially not allowing players right into the red zone yeah, well, it's, it is a lovely segue into the first discussion point of this week. Uh, we have to start on that because COVID is affecting the Premier League once again. But this time, it might actually help a lot of Premier League clubs. There's red flag nations. Players are not going to be allowed to go on these at the moment, Ben. Um, is, is that the kind of message coming out of clubs? And is this going to be allowed? Because this is almost unprecedented that international players are being blocked from their clubs. Yeah, so we've seen this uh, decision um, last year, uh, initially with UEFA in conjunction with FIFA, made the decision to temporarily place um, you know, regulations or protocol in place that said you know, players effectively didn't have to travel um, for international mm-hmm. fixtures. And that was based on uh, protecting uh, you know, the well-being of not only the players, but those associated in and around all of those teams uh, and also supporters. Um, so that initial, um, I suppose, protocol was was put in place for a month and then that was extended earlier in the year. And now it looks as if the Premier League has unanimously decided that players who um, would uh, be required to play in, in those countries which are flagged as a, a, in the red zone uh, will no longer have to travel to their countries, therefore you know, eliminating the risk of of players maybe having to self-isolate or be put into quarantine on their return. And just following that up then, Raj, do you think that that's a good move from the Premier League? And do you think that it might benefit teams in more ways than just you know keeping their players from being quarantined and things like that? Could it possibly make sure that they're a little bit more rested in what has been one of the most trying times of, of being a footballer? Yeah, absolutely. I'm For one... I think it's a very proactive move for the reasons that Ben mentioned. And then secondly, like you said, just giving these players some rest. We saw what happened last year with international play as well. You know, it just adds another load and stimulus, not just playing games, but then traveling, which then disrupts your sleep schedule, then disrupts your training schedule. You get back and you have to reacclimate again, right? So there's all these different variables that come into play when you're traveling and you're gone for multiple weeks. 
And so with that situation there, I think a lot of people were, were kind of worried about Mo Salah and other people like that. Is it just going to be a continuation of working on things in the training ground then, Ben? Like, will this have disrupted any schedules with clubs or are they just going to be kind of training normally? And, and again, a, another positive, maybe working towards games after that international break. Yeah, so typically, I mean, managers um, look at their squads in, in, in different ways. Um, some prefer to give them a, a you know a, a few days off, completely away from the training ground, and then reconvene later on in the week as they start to focus on what would be game week four. Um, so those will be done on an individual basis. Of course, in terms of the clubs, it's going to be a benefit. You don't have that that risk associated with travelling away with with their international countries and, and therefore the quarantine. However, you know the risk of COVID and, and um, testing positive for the virus does not go away. Um, but yes, Neil Lennon took his group out to Dubai for a pre, I think it was a training camp. Um, and although there wasn't any, you know, breaking any rules or regulations associated with that travel, uh, and, you know, several of those players actually came back and tested positive. And also in the public eye, it did not reflect very well against those individuals and all the clubs. So I think, you know, just because maybe international players have been given that pass to miss the internationals, and you know, I wouldn't expect them to be jetting off to all, you know, corners of the, of the globe, you know, making the most of this time off. I would expect them back on the training pitches. And probably the, the final discussion point, Ben, on this COVID situation, but one of the talking points, I don't know if Raj has got like an uh, opinion on this, but there was a few people saying, why was an Arsenal's game postponed? You know, they had a COVID outbreak, it affected quite a few of the squad members, and we've, we've kind of seen it in performances. I don't know if Arsenal would have done better, uh, I don't know if it was tactics, but what are the specific rules about a game being postponed now? What, How many squad members do you have to have before it's kind of called off and said, play this a little bit later in the season? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, um, the, the Premier League, the Football Association, are heavily reluctant against postponing any games, end of. So for something like that to happen, it, it needs to constitute quite a severe outbreak. Um, in terms of, of, of availability of players, what the league says is if you can have, I think it was 19 players, which includes under 23s um, and two goalkeepers, you have to fulfil that fixture. Now, with Arsenal... Um, you know, where do you draw the line? Uh, you can look at a number of teams this season who have, you know, Everton opened their first game with five players sidelined. Um, you, you then say, well, actually Newcastle have been affected. And then also just because players haven't, um, you know, Newcastle, maybe look at the likes of Carl Darlow as a goalkeeper. They may be the first team, I think, in Premier League history where they may be required to name four goalkeepers registered as part of their 25-man squad, which could have, you know, a detrimental effect down the line in terms of, 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 of um, you know, income and transfers. So uh, the fact that it wasn't postponed doesn't come as any surprise. Um, and um, do I think, you know, for me, look, it's, a, it's suck it and see. You know, you've got a big enough squad. You've got a big enough budget. I think the likes of maybe a Brentford, a Brighton, you know, those teams with, with smaller squads inherently, you know, if they're going to be hit, they're going to be hit a lot harder than Arsenal. And somewhere down the line, these teams are going to be picking up injuries and or COVID-related absence, which will have a big impact. It just so happens at this point, you know, it's Arsenal's turn. Do you agree with those sentiments, Raj? Yeah, I mean, I think the sentiment that I've gotten from the Premier League is that, you know, we're kind of over the COVID postponements, right? They're trying to kind of move on from that. So if you have enough players, the 19 that Ben mentioned, they're going to play your games. And I think the impetus like Ben now is on the players a little bit more because, you know, just because you can doesn't mean you should. And I think that, that's what he was getting at before with Celtic as well. And so it's the same thing here. You're going to see teams you know, fluctuate throughout the year with it. So I think it'll even out overall over the balance of the year and i think another example is you know norwich norwich was hit really hard with covid during preseason i mean should should some of their guys even be playing out there are they even fit so where do you draw the line at this point right is it just because they're positive are they ready to go or i mean are these guys even fit right now we don't know so tough tough uh risk reward and decision of course 
Now, something else that we thought that we were over was Kevin De Bruyne's injury. We thought that the fact that he was back in the squad, we considered him, you know, to, to be fit and playing. And then all of a sudden, there's another injury saga surrounding him. So what's the latest information now, Ben? Uh, I mean, the, the, the official line from Pep was that Kevin De Bruyne felt a little disturbance as he, as he reported, in his ankle. Um, that must have been late on Thursday or certainly early on the Friday morning, which resulted in him missing the final training session ahead of game week two. Now, that kept Kevin De Bruyne out of the game. We know it's a carryover from that ankle ligament problem that he suffered in the Euros and subsequently played on and obviously exacerbated that. And Raj, so... Is this just going to be a, a continual thing through the season where it's it's kind of not got a set period as to whether he returns or not? Yeah, so here's, I mean, I think De Bruyne right now, he's case in point of what happens when you try to rush through an ankle injury. You can come back, you might be able to play through it, but then you suffer the consequences later on and it becomes very, very touch and go. You know, so with any ankle ligament injury, especially you had the high ankle injury, you know, that the ankle is heavily loaded and stressed during football all the time, especially now you have a high profile player like De Bruyne who takes on challenges. He's in, he's in a lot of uh, contact often, right? He plays kind of in within obviously a lot of traffic. And so that again, adds to the demands placed on him. So I think you're going to see it be you know, touch and go for a while here. And it's truly going to be that day to day status for him. And does his age profile, coupled with the fact he's had a few big injuries over the last few seasons, worry you a little bit about this gamble being a huge kind of almost failure of the risk-reward situation that you've talked about? I think to, to an extent, he definitely has a lot of wear on him. He's played long seasons with City, but he doesn't really have that concern of an injury history. Honestly, in this case, whether it was someone who was 21 or 31 or 41 with this type of injury, if you try to rush through it, you will pay the consequences. Like another example we saw last year was Odegaard. He, and he played through a very mild ankle injury for Norway, came back and he was held out for almost two weeks. And that was a far less significant injury than De Bruyne had. And so if you had to guess a time frame for when he will be back, do you think it's shortly after the international break? I, I would say, honestly, I, I, it's so hard to say now because you're seeing these reactions from his ankle. When they held him out for a while after Euros. He came back. He saw the specialist after Ramon Kugat, which is part of why I'm assuming he was initially cleared to come back. But if you continue to have these aggravations, at some point you might have to really – pull the reins on him and give him enough time to be able to recuperate fully. Now, another big discussion point this game week and, and going forward as well is about the rules on tackling physicality in the Premier League. There's been a lot of talk about new leniency. Uh, Jurgen Klopp and Ole Gunnar Solskjaer are being kind of big ones saying that they're almost against this new role, which at the start of the season saw officials being briefed to make football as free-flowing as possible and to not intervene as much. But with this, more physicality also becomes more likelihood of injury, especially at a time of players being extremely fatigued due to the Euros, COVID and non-stop playing. Ben, what is your like opinion on this position? Do you think that maybe this rule change was brought in a season too early and that players should have had a little bit more time to get to full fitness and then introduce something like this? I think the difficulty with this this rule change is it's quite subjective. It's um, you know it's very difficult. You know every year we see see tweaks to the rules, the gameplay, all used to maybe enhance the user experience, support us, let the game flow. But with this letting the game flow freely, it, there's a lot of grey areas around that, and it's it's hard to to contextualise exactly what it means within the game. I think. If you're watching, uh, it's certainly as a spectacle, the game has improved. But as a player, you're now wondering that um, a tackle that you made last season uh, that maybe went punished with a yellow card is now, uh, you know, not even being flagged as a as a foul and games are flown. So, so players don't know the boundaries, you know, within the game that, that they're playing. They don't understand really now what a, 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 a fair tackle is. 
players then cannot, I suppose, adjust the game accordingly. And it's almost like this, this, let's suck it and see. Let's see how far we can push things. Let's see what we can get away with. Um, and look, there are going to be casualties along the way because there isn't that, that clear FA directive that says, look, you know, this is, uh, this is what you're allowed to do now and this is what you're not. It's, um, it's all in the, the eyes of the beholder in terms of the referee and, and whether they choose to, to use VR and use that video playback to then assess. But, you know, we've seen in those early, early games, um, there's a lot that's being left um, and then overlooked. And, and for me, I say that there are players within the game who will always continually look to push the boundaries, call it gamesmanship, call it whatever you like. Shithousery is another one I've heard it reference. <laughs> but, you know, there are always going to be players and teams and managers and coaches who are continually pushing it out because the risk and rewards of success versus failure in Premier League and the money involved is huge. But then on the topic of, of injuries, do you think that this is actually putting players at an unfair increased risk at, at such a vital time? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, um, not just now, but at any stage of the season. You know, we're talking about players, seasoned professionals who know how to play the game. And when I say that, it means they know how to tackle. They know how to break a leg. They know how to break an ankle. They know how to do things and get away with it. Uh, you know, they've been brought up doing this, uh, you know, knowing how to tackle. So, uh, and when you have players who, who know how to do this and are maybe allowed to go through, you know, uh, we've seen in recent times a banning of the, of the scissor tackle and, you know, the, and following through it. If those kind of, of measures are allowed to, to creep back in to the game, then ultimately it's, the players are being put at risk every time they go on the pitch. And then also, you know, the football association, you know, the referees association, they've also got a, a duty of care as well as the professional clubs to look after these players. And if something serious was to happen, and then maybe I've come across it already in the past, when players have been mismanaged, mishandled, then you open yourself up to potentially you know, a, a, you know, a legal uh, action against you. And you know what? Uh, quite rightly so, because, you know, if a player, if, if it was to be a career-ending injury or an injury that results in a player in a loss of earnings, and by that, that can be non-appearances or bonus or returning from injury and not being able to return to pre-injury levels, then, you know, that potentially can cost a player, you know, a hell of a lot of money, millions and millions of pounds over that short career. Raj, adding to that then, is this a step backwards or in ambiguity in the rules, but also in terms of putting players at risk? Yeah, both. I'm not, I'm not a fan at all of the general application of, of the rule. Like Ben said, it adds a lot of gray area. You're going to add even more inconsistency to the premier league between you know what refs call what which then leads itself to a whole plethora of other things but the reality is it adds a lot of risk for players i mean for example Fofan, the challenge on fofana right yes he got the ball should he ever should it ever be attempted from a risk reward perspective in my opinion no you're coming in from behind your trail leg is there you know that can break someone's leg party same thing same type of challenge right these challenges that come from behind We've seen these plenty of times. I don't mind applying it to other areas like the jostling aspects, right? Okay, apply it there. But when it comes to actual tackles, these are high risk, high velocity movements. And like Ben said, you know, these are trained players. They know what they're doing. So now if they know they have more rope, they're going to come in harder. They're going to leave that trail leg in, which then of course leads to more injury, right? And so... I'm just not a fan of it. Why do you think this was brought in then? Because the Premier League is probably the most physical league in Europe's top five leagues, maybe one of the most in Europe in general. Uh, it just, it, it doesn't seem to have an explanation. I don't think fans were really calling for this either. Yeah, I don't quite understand that. I mean, I understand, like I said, you know, allowing more of the jostling aspects where you have players flopping over and stops the game. But I never 
even, you know, whether on Twitter or talking to people, never saw anyone say, hey, uh, players, you know, I want players to be able to, you know, f- to commit tackles stronger. I, I never really saw the need for that. So I just, I don't understand the rationale. I don't know if they've even given a rationale for it, but maybe Ben can speak more to that. Yeah, Ben. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the only sort of light that I can shine on this situation, and, that, and we don't fully know what's going on, but I heard Michael Oliver, um, you know, probably one of our, our best referees in the Premier League, and talk about his experience at the Euros and the directives that they had for refereeing the games about you know, almost allowing this free-flowing spectacle to keep their involvement to a minimum. You know, they're not necessarily to, there to, to intervene on every occasion. It's more of a, of a management to ensure the, the flow and the entertainment of the game. Um, I mean... Does this even go back to the Super League with um, with Perez from Real Madrid? And he talked about the spectacle of football and how that young people just aren't interested anymore. And unless we do something, unless we address this need, then you know we're not going to have this this grassroots um, feed into professional football. People will switch off. And is it a move to try and make football a little bit more exciting? you know, fast flow. And, and is it, yes, to us, it's it's something that we, um, you know, we didn't necessarily felt needed brought to the game, but are they maybe, maybe catering to a new audience, a, an audience that is used to, you know, this, this UFC, this YouTube, uh, you know, this Gen X uh, <laughs> generation who need something and want to see the tackles and the thrills and spills of sport. You know, maybe I, I'm, I'm speculating, but, um, it, it's a right. It, it, it's an argument that you certainly cannot rule out. And I mean, if that is the argument used for it, I think they're out of touch as to why young people aren't tuning in. Maybe they should revisit the pricing out of young people. That's probably the first aspect that needs addressing. Yeah. But I think we've we've covered that. Maybe we can discuss that more at length another day in terms of why young people aren't tuning in. But let's move it on to somebody who I think is making football easily so watchable, so exciting. It's Mikel Antonio. But there's been a few reports coming out this week and previously as well after Mikel Antonio gave an interview about him having a new regime and a new lifestyle to make sure that his hamstrings don't give up as easily this season. Um, I guess I'm not sure who to start with, Ben, because we don't really know who is... <laughs> OK, we'll, we'll throw it to Raj then. Um, but we don't really know the ins and outs of this regime. It was kind of just talked about. But how much can you actually train to protect hamstrings when he's had so many problems already? Yeah, well, firstly, I, I want to point out that last week I said that he was my most impressive performer and I was concerned about his hamstrings. So it's a good segue into today, into this week. And when it comes to you know nutrition, training, yes, of course, there's very specific ways you can work on reducing hamstring injury. And then, but then there's other aspects as well, right? Nutrition, sleep, stress, and these are known variables that can help expedite recovery and reduce uh, injuries. And so you have a lot of players who may not be introduced to that early on in their careers or who don't understand the benefits of it until they are injured. And And in his case, it looks like he's finally beginning to understand that there are other components that do add to his health and fitness. And, you know, hopefully he's able to maintain the level of performances. I mean, he's been, he's been by far, in my opinion, you know, the outstanding performer of the season thus far quite early, but you know, I'd, I'd be very interested to hear more of the details. I don't think we'll ever hear it from him, but I think it's a good phase shift and it brings attention to in general, the idea that you need to focus on your body not just from the you know training or the strength side, but hitting all the different components. But how how much can you actually do when it's got to this point? You know, he's age thirty. It's it's almost like is it going to be able to to make sure that his hamstrings don't give up, or is it more just making sure that he he has a few more years left in his career? Because to me, uh, and I don't know as much as you, obviously Raj and Ben. But it seems almost like at this point the damage has been done and it's it's reducing future risk factors rather than kind of giving longevity for the moment. 
It can do both. It can do both. It can reduce the probability of, of a recurrent injury, which then, of course, helps him in the short term and then into the long term as well. And so I think it's a combination of both. It also really depends on we know he's had hamstring injuries, but there's a lot of details of a hamstring injury that we're not privy to. So it depends on those specifics as well. I mean, but- what I would go on that is, you know, we just have to, Ryan Giggs. Maybe he's a great example of a player who suffered from really bad muscular, soft tissue problems, hamstring early on in his career. But as he got that little bit you know, older, as he matured, as he understood and appreciated again the complexities of not just, you know, of, of going out there and playing 90 minutes. It's about, I think, gone are the days now of, you know, it's just about football. This is a lifestyle. This is a, you know, this is your occupation. This is your job. And for me, as well, I, w- I was reading some literature on, on Michael Antonio, and I see a distinct mind shift and, and, and the philosophy of how he's approaching the game. And that comes down to, to maybe what seems as simple as a number change. He talked about his switch from, from being offered that number nine shirt at West Ham mm-hmm. and how he was really reluctant to do so. He loves number 30. 30 was his number. And when he was offered that number nine shirt and, you know, finally now you're recognised as the West Ham United striker, he said he had to take some time away and really consider that, give it some really serious thought. But eventually he said, well, you know, if I want to be known as, you know, a West Ham striker, the goal scorer, I'll take that number nine. And with it, you almost begin to understand that the game changes in different positions of the pitch and, and he's required you know, those explosive, quick, powerful movements with, you know, big, burly defenders and very close proximity. You know, if you want to be playing on the edge and you want to be scoring, well, any any his own words, potentially 20 goals this season in one of the toughest leagues in the world, there are no half measures. So you either commit to the process 100%, and by doing so, we're talking about, you know, what you're doing on and off the training pitches and away from the training ground and looking after your body, or you don't. Because if you don't, you will get found out. The game will find you out. And we're not saying that he maybe hasn't led the correct lifestyle in the past. But what we're saying is you try to do everything to try and mitigate those risks and mini- you know, minimise any problems that may crop up down the line. So, Raj, what are the kind of things that, he may be introducing, of course, we don't know, but how can diet, how can training uh, affect this? Like, what, what kind of precautionary measures can now be put in place at this point of his career? I don't know if it's precautionary, but more so, I mean, dialing in your fitness, whether it's having, I think, just being more disciplined with it. Because you, you do have players who, they're going to have a nutritionist, but they still may not follow it. You can't force a player to follow the entire dietary plan. When it comes to the training, like Ben said, some of the demands on him may have changed now because he's now in that different different role. So perhaps he's now training to meet those higher level of demands, whether it's training his hamstrings to meet those sprint demands, training his body conditioning wise to meet those demands as well. So there's so many different things you can do to be able to try to expedite, you know, help with, recover from injuries, help prevent injuries or reduce that risk. And so um, the biggest thing though, it just comes down to, like Ben said, optimizing, you know, at the elite level, most of these guys are, let's say 98, 95, 98% of a hundred. You're trying to find guys who want to be at that hundred of a hundred and make, you know, you want that edge. It's a game of very, very thin margins. So if you can find that edge, it can, you know, lead to unlocking your game and hopefully, in his case, reducing that uh, re-injury risk as well. Somebody who seems to have found that is Cristiano Ronaldo. I remember reading about his diet plan and he's planning to lose, I think it was a kilogram or something every year. Is that something that maybe Antonio could look into as well? Because he's very, very muscular. Like, you look at his legs, he's carrying a, a lot of muscle weight there. Is that excessive? It's hard to say it that that that's so dependent on the player like you would like Triore as well right he's massive but every player has an ability to carry different type of weight and it depends on how they got to that point as well and so like you look at you look at like a, a Messi who may not look 
like he's built. But if you look at actually look at him when he's playing, right, he's extremely muscular as well. So it all depends on the player, their playing style, and what their body is prepared for as well. I mean, one final question to both of you, but on Adama Traore, do you believe that he's never been into the gym? That's the kind of line that he's found every time he comes on. He's just naturally that big, guys. Uh, ben, f- first of all, from you, yes, no? <laughs> well, I've actually spoke to guys uh, down at Wolves uh, who assure me, and, and, and when people throw, it's a bit of a throwaway remark, he's never been in, in the gym, he's never done weight. Of course he has. Um, but there's a lot of sports specific stuff in there, a lot of body weight exercise, a lot of repetition. Yeah. He may not just be standing over a barbell or a set of dumbbells. You know, <laughs> everything that he does is for a purpose to suit his style of play. Raj mentioned it with Michael Antonio, how he has to maybe the positional changes within his game be quite different demands on the body and therefore you need to condition yourself in a slightly different way you know try on he does that um so you know it's not just that he, the guy works extremely <laughs> extremely hard in training you know away from the pitch to to be the player he is and the you know to, to have the physicality that he's got there I guess anything to add to that, Raj, or do you just agree with those comments? No, I agree. I think I think he's just being cheeky about it. He's not doing he's not the he's not sitting there doing eighty pound dumbbell curls, right? He's actually it's actually very, very specific and specialized training. Yeah. I, I guess we're just all really jealous of of Traore. He's he's body goals, isn't he? Final person that we have to talk about though is McTominay, Ben. Uh somebody that is in the team or isn't in the team i mean is there just an unclear image of what is actually going wrong with him at the moment uh, i mean just to sort of clarify and this comes back from a, a lot of comments on on the timeline um ollie talked about keeping consistency was in his start 11 ahead of uh, the game on saturday against southampton he obviously made two changes one of those changes was scott mctominay and speaking to i think it was bt sport ollie said that mctominay wasn't fit um, to start the game, but he could maybe be brought off the bench if he was. And that's basically what happened. Now, what we've seen this week that Scott McTominay has actually been withdrawn from the upcoming World Cup qualifiers for um, for Scotland. So that in itself, you know, you have a lot of people who are saying, well, how is he fit for Manchester United? How is he not fit to start if he can come on? And how can he play 30 minutes here, but in two weeks' time he can't play for Scotland? Um, and it's just about, again, we talk about We'll go back to it, and it, it is a great point. It's risk and reward, and we're talking about such an early part of the season. We don't know the specifics. You know, we don't know if during the international break, if Scott McTominay is going to have this issue addressed. It, it may just be a case of, um, you know, he, he might need some time away from the training pitches. It could be that he may be going for surgical intervention. We've seen that in the past with Jamie Vardy, with, you know, um, niggling groin complaints so it could be that he, he, he's going under the knife we just don't know um there's always things going on that to you know the average joe in the street will never ever get to hear see and fully understand so hopefully like i say maybe just shed a little bit of light on that and, and understand that you know the complexities around injuries and what's going on it's never black and white i mean raj bringing the point to you Do you believe that there's a bit of, you know, smoke and mirrors in these situations with players, the the kind of international injury-itis, or do you think that, you know, quite often it is just teams kind of protecting their players? I mean, there's always smoke and mirrors when it comes to managers. I mean, especially in the Premier League, right? The less information you can have get out, the more at an advantage that you are, because if if we're guessing, other teams are likely guessing as well. So it doesn't really behoove you as a manager to put out all this information if you don't need to, right? So there's clearly, I mean, they're being coy about it. But like Ben said, it comes down to a risk-reward situation where he might be, you know, kind of battling through an injury. That 30 minutes might have just been a test to see what he's able to handle within a game. And then you assess the next day, see how he responded, right? So when a player plays... It's not as simple as just, oh, he's 100% fit. Sometimes it's just to see if we can, if we can even handle that. And so that might have been that. They might have assessed the next day and realized, hey, 
uh, he didn't respond as well as they wanted to. So let's keep him out of international break. Or it's something where they thought that, you know, the test didn't go well and they're saying, hey, you know, maybe he does need a little bit of a, of a procedure to, to rectify this. So yeah. will we ever know? Maybe, maybe not. But it, there's certainly always these smoke and mirrors around international breaks. I mean, what I would go on just to quickly add upon a, a point that you touched on, or reference the international injury. And yes, to an extent, um, the data does back up that. But what it doesn't, or, or, or what, to give it a little bit of context, players who are involved in competitive game versus non-competitive fixtures. You know, we see um, a return of over um, 60, 70% of those who've missed non-competitive games versus competitive. So, you know, with this being a World Cup qualifier and Scott McTummy knowing that the player he is and has been involved with the national team and has happily been a part of that, you know, successful uh, squad, then, you know, that's a, a fairly good indication that, you know, there is some kind of underlying problem there that needs to be addressed. Well, in terms of it then, we talked about risk-reward. I think people have been very rewarded tuning in this week with the content. As always, though, make sure to subscribe to the channel uh, because, you know, we're going to be rewarding you every week. We're going to be talking through the international break as well because there could be some important injuries that happened then and we want to keep you as up-to-date as possible with the tactics, with the data and cutting through that fake news. Also, before we move on uh, and wrap up the show, do check out Raj at 3CB Performance. There's just so much good content on there. I love checking out his Twitter feed because, you know, you, you just get so many good explanations, great videos popping up on there, and he keeps you in the loop as much as Ben does as well. But for me, I'm going to say goodbye. I'm going to hand it to Ben just to sign us out, though. Yeah, and it's a goodbye from me. Thanks again. Great podcast, guys. Hope you enjoyed that. Uh, please feel free to bang your comments in the box below. We do read everything and we'll try to respond as many as possible. We're back later on in the week with more great content. So we will see you all again very soon.